the 1970 Challenger. This car makes the scene like a bolt from the blue. For a lot of people, Challenger is the dream come true. There's a standard Challenger 6, the 225. From here, the offerings go right on up to stormers like this 440 Magnum six-pack and the 426 Hemi. Both are available on Challenger RT. This time on Graveyard Cars, Mark's dream project of mass producing the iconic Alpine White Challenger, made famous by Richard Serafian in his landmark film Vanishing Point, has not disappeared from view. After half a decade of planning, the inaugural build is moving into the last phase of metal and the first stages of the paint shop. But with rust plaguing this Challenger's chassis, we had a bunch of rust on a freshly dipped car that had to go away. Metal replacement is more critical than ever. It gets me a little nervous every time. And the pressure for Josh is heating up. Meanwhile, in paint, Will dives headlong into another roadrunner. But is his confidence going to surpass the Iceman himself? Well, I painted the car, so I know the car came out great. And is Mark's number one painter going too far into full-on mutiny? This is complete BS. I'm going to choose not to engage, and let's just get this car back on track. Just put Kowalski. How do you spell that? <laughs> K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I, Kowalski. Cinema in the late 1960s and early 1970s was in the habit of breaking molds and appealing to the ebb and flow of countercultural tides. Produced by Norman Spencer and directed by Richard C. Serafian, Vanishing Point was not just another action film hitting the theaters in 1971. G. Cabrera Infante synonymously wrote the script, basing the story on actual events and expressing the rebellious zeitgeist of the era. But the film would become famous for more than themes and style. It was 20th Century Fox's studio executive Richard Zanuck who decided to feature the new 1970 Dodge Challenger RT in what may be its greatest film role of all time. Choosing the Challenger was initially intended to thank Chrysler for their practice of inexpensive car rentals to the studio, but the film's stunt coordinator also appreciated the decision, noting the Challenger's superlative suspension and horsepower. This epic chase film inspired generations of motorheads and filmmakers. Even Steven Spielberg has cited Vanishing Point as one of his favorite films, and Edgar Wright used the film as inspiration for his 2017 film, Baby Driver. For the film's many chase scenes and the devastating stunts featured in the film, five Dodge Challenger RTs in Alpine White were lent to the film by Chrysler, four cars with 440 engines and four-speed transmissions, while the fifth car sported a 383 and an automatic transmission. Other than heavy-duty shocks for the jump car, no special modifications were required for this motley crew of Alpine Challies. For the film's climactic and catastrophic ending, a 1967 Chevrolet Camaro was swapped in so that no Challengers were harmed in the filming. In fact, all five Challengers were returned to Chrysler when the film wrapped. Although they used an explosive-laden Camaro for the stunt, the 383 Challenger was involved. Stunt coordinator Kerry Lofton, who also worked on such reputation makers as Grand Prix, Bullet, and the French Connection, used the Challenger 383 as a tow vehicle to pull the Camaro at high speed into the waiting blades of the bulldozers for the film's finale. Although the film's initial domestic box office was short-lived and unimpressive, it managed to garner a wide reception abroad, which prompted a U.S. re-release as a double feature with the French Connection. With its growing cult status in drive-ins and a broadcast on network TV, the film garnered over 4 million in rentals in North America alone. A cult classic and an icon of American muscle immortalized in the celluloid frame. But for Mark and the ghouls, we prefer our icons made of metal. 
What kind of car is this going to go in? This is going in 1970 Dodge Challenger RT Alpine White. EW1 is the paint code. Made famous by Mr. Kowalski in a movie called Vanishing Point. One of the cars I want to catch everybody up with that's in the metal shop right now is our Vanishing Point Challenger tribute car. So we've been working on this off and on over the last few years. In fact, way too long. It needs to be done. This is a little car that I chose many years ago because of the way that it was optioned. It was a pretty plain hamburger car. Go Mango Orange EK2. It had a slant six, three-speed manual transmission on the floor. It was bucket seats, that's an option on that car. The one that jumps out at me, which is unusual on any car, especially not an FC, is that A63 molding group. So this little car, while it had nothing to offer the world, it still had that molding group, which meant you got the stone guard molding on it, you got the wheel opening moldings, back edge of hood molding, back edge of fender moldings, the SE finish panel on this plain hamburger little car. It was a runner driver when I first got the car, so I did get a tool around with it a little bit and have some fun. But for the most part, I knew from the day I bought it, we were gonna make it into something and being it was a manual shift car, what better opportunity to make a vanishing point clone out of than that. Over the years, this little Challenger donated a lot of parts to help other cars become whole again, kind of like the victim's purple car. <laughs> don't think I don't remember that. Uh, which meant when it came time to do the final disassembly on it, it was really easy. There wasn't a lot to take off of the car, so it went relatively quickly. On the Vanishing Point Challenger, Mark wanted to make this as correct as possible, so he sourced a 70 U code 440 HP engine, as well as a real Hemi 4 speed transmission and a replica Dana 60 rear end with 354 gears and 10 inch brake drums. The engine for the Vanishing Point Challenger was built before I got here. I looked it over and found out that it had been bored 30 thousandths over, had brand new forged pistons in it, so the rotating assembly was balanced. They even used six pack rods. The cam they used was a Comp Cams 270 with double roller timing chain and gears. So the heads were rebuilt with new bronze valve guides, fresh valve seats with a three angle cut and grind. So because this needed to look like a correct 70 Challenger RT, all of the original spark plug wires, separators and shields were used. The engine has been run on the engine test stand and it passed all the tests. I know it passed because I saw the footage and Mark started dancing like Mick Jagger, or was it Michael Jackson? One thing about Mark is that he never changes. He's been acting nutty like this since he was a kid, but it's all in good fun. So now that the drivetrain is done, my job is done until the car gets painted. On the Vanishing Point Challenger, right after we got it disassembled, we sent it out, had it dipped, Came back, Will did a good job of dp 90 ing everything, putting the epoxy on it. But then it kind of got sidebarred for a while. And that meant it had to go outside in the weather. And even the DP90, after a while, can't stand up against the weather without it being top coated. Plus the areas we couldn't get to with the DP90. So bottom line was, we had a bunch of rust on a freshly dipped car, be it two years earlier, that had to go away. The metal dipper couldn't get it off of there. So we brought it back here and decided that we would do a media blast on it to get all the rust off so we could start fresh. So when it comes to our Vanishing Point Challenger, we had to do some sandblast work on it. The crazy part about it is, is Mark decided to do it himself, which really made, doesn't make sense because he owns the company. Why is he gonna go out there and sandblast? So why not have Tiny Hands do it or somebody else do it? There's no reason for the owner of Graveyard Cars to be out there sandblasting. Then it dawned on me, a couple things. First of all, hey, look who's trying to get back on TV. Mark's trying to steal the camera time, so he's gonna go sandblast. Secondly, it's an opportunity to, for him to do his silliness. Whatever jumps into that AJ head of his, whether it be Michael Jackson or, or Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson, it's an opportunity for Mark to get in front of the camera, be silly, and once again, steal everything around him. So once Mark was done with what he wanted to do, he kicks it back over to me. I'm able to DP 90 the areas that he just sandblasted. Once I do that, I can get it right over to Josh in the metal shop. Now, once we had all of that rust stuff cured, 
blasted it and did the DP-90 on it, I was able to cut Josh loose on doing the metal work. Now remember, we have these frame jigs now, so we can do any or all of that car at one time. In this particular case, I always like to use the front to rear philosophy. So the first thing I cut him loose to do was to replace the left front, right front inner fenders with the new AMD sheet metal. After Josh had the inner fenders done on the front of the car, he could move to the middle. This thing was a pretty rusty car, even outside of what we did to it by letting it set out in the rain for those couple of years. We ended up doing the main floor uh, left and right step wells in the back under seat pan, but he started with the main floor. So the main floor process is just a beautiful thing to see because we have it down to a science. We have the frame jig, so everything stays put. We can cut it apart. Watching the floor pan go in and seeing the combination of spot welding and MIG welding and how precise everything is, you just know when you look at that floor that it's the way it's supposed to be. It's going to be strong. It's going to have the integrity it's supposed to have. It's going to look right even before we put paint on it, even though we're going to cover it all up. It looks right. After he had the main floor welded in, he could move to the rear portion of the cabin, which is the under seat pan. Now, the way these cars are layered together from the factory, the main floor goes in first, then the under seat pan, then the left and right step wells. So that means he has to install that under seat pan first. Another thing when you're doing these under seat pans, for those of you at home that are working on these, you wanna make sure that you transfer all the components over that may or may not come on these new panels. So you might be all done, got the car painted and find out that it didn't have a provision for the dual exhaust or it didn't have a provision for the, the seat hooks or something. So compare your old parts that come off with your new parts that go in. Now, once the under seat pan is in and the main floor pan is in, you can install the left and the right foot wells. Remember now, folks, on a Challenger, those step wells are how they find the additional two inches of wheelbase in these cars. These step wells are exactly two inches longer on a Challenger than they are on a Barracuda. Notice the way that we're overlapping this left and right step well, okay? This is how the factory did it. So make note of that. Make note of your car when you do it too. Take lots of photos before, lots of photos after you do these repairs. Once we have all of the cabin metal, which is the under seat pan, the left and right step wells, main floor, inner fenders in the front. Once all those are in place, we can move to the very last part of the car, which is the rear of the car. When it comes to replacing something like the trunk floor, which is one of the first things you'll want to put in, you really need to have all the metal that you're going to be replacing removed. Remove the rear body panel, both quarter panels, wheelhouses, get stuff out of your way. This way, when you go in there and you set that new pan down, you're not dealing with anything else. You can set that pan exactly where the factory wanted you to set it, weld it up, and then build out from it. Kind of like getting the frame done on the house first. You get that done and you can build outwards. So you guys may remember I did an A469 Roadrunner uh, for Mr. Jones. Beautiful car, champagne, love everything about it. Well, here we are, fast forward just a few months, I'm doing almost the exact same car, same color, except this one gets a black vinyl top. So when it comes to the A4 Silver, I was a little nervous about, you know, how's it gonna cover? But I did a spray out first, it took your normal eight coats to cover with a drop coat or two at the end to make sure the metallic lays out perfectly. I thought it was gonna be transparent. You know, it, it, those light metallics tend to be transparent, but for some reason, this color covers great, it lays out great, and it's honestly a super easy color to spray. So one of the huge changes here at Graveyard Cars is we have an in-house interior guy. So before I would finish the car, cut and buff, undercoating, give it to Mark and Doug to put the drivetrain in, then it would get loaded up and go to Stan's upholstery. Well, Stan's decided they want to retire. Well, we took their interior guy, we hired him here. So once Mark and Doug are done with the drivetrain, our own guy can go right into his side of the shop and put the headliners in, put the vinyl tops on. It is such a time saver and invaluable part to have in-house. So I've worked with Stan's upholstery since 1985. I've always done the majority of the vinyl tops and the headliners for graveyard cars. So when John decided to retire and close up the shop, it just seemed natural for me to come over here and continue doing the work that 
Mark's always appreciated from me. Like everybody who works here, we're all very particular about the work that we do on these cars. The headliners come in a box all folded up and they have a lot of wrinkles in them and it takes, uh, I use sometimes a steamer, sometimes I use a heat gun to get the wrinkles out of the headliners and you can do some of that before you start putting the headliner in. You always have to do it when you get done. After they're hanging, there's wrinkles that stretch out a lot better when they're under tension. Revealed to the world on February 18th, 2014, this legendary Dodge Challenger is undoubtedly one for the record books. A 440 Magnum engine, automatic transmission, the ever-popular Plum Crazy, paired with a luggage rack, luxurious houndstooth interior, a bold bumblebee stripe, and topped with a power sunroof, this 1970 Challenger RT was literally the only one of its kind. It arrived at the graveyard as a stripped hull, and the team spent countless hours perfecting the metal, crafting the body, and then laying out the iconic FC7 Plum Crazy. That is beautiful. See, and that's what it should look like on the car. It should look wet, and it should be covered completely. When the car made its way into assembly, the ghouls eagerly descended to detail this remarkable RT. Some, maybe a little too eagerly. Do not slip off like this. So once you're in that position, make sure you're straight up and down on it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Remember that part about holding onto it around there? Uh -huh. I got it. Oh, that was scary. That is scary. <laughs> While the car's elements aligned, the shop was visited for the first time by the equally one of a kind, Tony D'Agostino. How are you, buddy? Good, good to meet you, Mark. Yeah, good Hi, to meet you. Good to meet you. Hi. And Mark was met with Tony's signature East Coast bravado, not to mention his unquenchable urge to correct Mark's many Mopar foibles. Well, the 22-inch radiator cars didn't get the clutch. Do you know there's a difference? Do you have the right uh, speaker curls for it? Difference between what? Uh, Barracuda and Challenger. Even back then, the Iceman could not catch a break. Long before the tools that would facilitate shifting high-value cars through low-value doorways, the team struggled to squeeze by with novel improvisations, often with disastrous results. Or not. All right. They didn't learn their lesson the first time. But fortunately, this time, the Challenger escaped without a scratch. A one-of-a-kind car demanded a one-of-a-kind reveal, so Showman Warman decided to unveil his masterpiece at the newly completed Graveyard Cars Theater. <laughs> wow. This is amazing. Dang, man. Wow. wow. Yeah, well, yeah, dang, man, ought to be more than that. I should be smelling dumb right now. You well, the last time yourself. I was in here. The season culminated at a Mo party with the ghouls showing off their work. Beautiful 440 Magnum orange. It's and good, Royal. I'm just laughing because you're um, so entertaining. And Here's reliving the, the era with an epic drive in this one of a kind sunroof Challenger RT. This car's epic journey didn't end there. This car was driven hard and put through the paces, resulting in an engine explosion and a return to the graveyard. So the guy who's driving the truck says, I'm idling along, all of a sudden he hears, and the engine just explodes. I believe that he was driving along, and he heard, and it made a weird noise and stopped running. Anybody who wants to say that this engine came apart while it was idling is out of their mind, okay? Mark and his team dissected the twisted metal, repaired the engine, and sent the car to a new home. The new owner enjoyed the car for a time before releasing it into the world at auction. With a life-size cardboard cutout of the Iceman himself, this one-of-a-kind power sunroof Challenger RT cruised across the auction block 
and garnered a whopping $127,000, making this one-of-a-kind challenger a one-of-a-kind moment in Graveyard Cars history. So I'm all done with the front sheet metal and the middle sheet metal on the Vanishing Point Challenger. Now that I'm done with that, I'm gonna move on to the back end. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace the trunk floor and then I'm gonna move on to the outer wheelhouses and then the quarter panels. In this case, I start with the trunk floor pan. So with our spot welder, we got a bunch of different attachments. This one allows me to really reach in deep on this floor and get this frame rail. There's a couple spots I can't quite get with it, so I will have to MIG weld them. But for the most part, after I'm done, it has that factory OE look. Our Vanishing Point Challenger is moving very nicely now through the shop after its little hiatus. Doug has the entire drivetrain completed. Engine, transmission, rear end, all the suspension pieces are ready to go in. Josh just has a few more pieces on the back end of the car to weld up before he can kick it over to the mudroom and they can begin the refinishing process. All right, so today I'm gonna to be installing the uh, outer wheel well on our uh, Vanishing Point uh, Challenger. Seems like a pretty easy job, but this is one of the more important things, uh, in my opinion. If this doesn't get in the right place, it's really gonna make my job a lot harder. I'm gonna take a lot more time trying to get things to line up. I'm gonna have to move a lot more metal, and it's really gonna affect the quarter panels the most. And in my opinion, the quarter panels being in the right place can is, is really detrimental to the car looking nice. That really what's make this stressful is until it's fully welded, you never know for sure. First thing I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get this wheelhouse put in place. I'm gonna sink a couple screws in there that I have that I've already used as my pre-fitment holes. And then I'm gonna put a couple clamps on just to make sure it's nice and tight to the inner wheelhouse so I'm not, you know, creating any extra dents, trying to squeeze things together with the spot welder. So one of my favorite attachments with our car aligner spot welder is the big C-clamp. Before we had this, we had to do a lot more MIG welding, but now that we have this, I'm actually able to reach in a lot of places. Now I'm able to get down the whole outer wheelhouse and make it look exactly like factory did. So after I'm done with the spot welder, I have to go back through and MIG weld a few things. I have to MIG weld a couple of the screw hole locating spots, and then I have to go back and also get some of the spot weld blow throughs. I think it's really important to get these done because one, structural integrity is extremely important, and two, it just looks a lot cleaner. Still to come, Mark checks out a competition that is way out of his Mopar wheelhouse. From Eugene to Baja on a $3,000 budget. Will he and Doug bite off more than they can chew? This will not be as much fun for us as it will be for Mark. And set up the ghouls for a costly and dangerous detour. You get a tattoo along the way, you get points. And is Mark's competitive urge going to derail the team when they can't afford to fall behind. It doesn't matter, we don't have time for it because like at the end of the day, it's gonna be Mark comes out victorious. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns.
Now here's something I'm really excited about. A friend of mine, acquaintance, was telling me about a Baja 3000. It's something they've come up with. I think people do it. It's kind of like a gumball rally where a group of people get together and you have all these check-in points and you have a destination point and you, and you can earn points and you can win this competition. So what, what in the world is a Baja 3000? Well, actually, it's a, it's a trip. It's a venture. It's a competition where you got to make it from Eugene to Baja on a $3,000 budget. So that includes purchase of vehicle, transportation budget. When I heard the details about that they have this real limited budget to buy cars with and it all is inclusive and you have to be able to get to all these points, I just thought it was such a neat idea. So the day that they were kicking this off and heading out on their venture, I brought the camera guys down. I think, keep in mind now, this has nothing to do with Mopars right now, but it will. It will have something to do with Mopars. So see how this works and you'll see how I'm thinking. And what all about the tires and fuel and all that? Is that included in We the did inside the exempt fuel because you know? of today's yep. prices is probably good originally idea. this was eugene de cabo 500 we started planning it about 20 years ago yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow um, but with inflation stuff we moved up to 3,000. so i think this is a great concept i think it'd be a lot of fun it'd be a real team builder in their particular case i think they had a couple thousand dollars a piece to spend on a car that included all the maintenance so you had to be thrifty about buying your car i'm ryan murdoch with team fox gabriel hamill hey alex felice this is our 2006 Land Rover LR3, genuine box. Team box. These guys were so excited about what they were doing, I kind of caught that same fever when I was there. Hey, we're Team Next Level. Um, I'm Captain. I'm Mr. Worldwide. We've we've been best friends for about 25 years. Uh -huh. We paid a $1,400 for this 84 Lincoln Town Car. Now they're gonna have check-in points. You're also gonna get extra points. A guy was saying that if you picked up a hitchhiker along the way, you get points for that if, if that, Hitchhiker has a guitar and plays something, there's extra points for that. So it's kind of a fun little thing. I think we could adapt into our Mopar world. There's a scorecard. It's 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 not a race. There are checkpoints where if you make it to certain checkpoints by certain times, you will receive points. But, you know, picking up a hitchhiker, that's an easy example. So you're trying to gather as many points, that's how you win the race. That's right. Correct. Yeah. All right, so here's what I'm kind of thinking. We have a very low budget for cars, maybe a thousand dollars. You have to buy it just has to be a Chrysler, Plymouth, or Dodge product. Could be any of those. Low budget, like that. It includes all the maintenance. So you're gonna want some little six cylinder nothing car nobody cares about. And all the things that are factored into is how much you paid for it, if you broke it, if you yep. made it. Right? Yes, if you made it. And then all to. these little tricks along the way yeah. to pick up extra points. Yep. That's right. And along the way, we can have the bonus points like they have, right? If you pick up a hitchhiker along the way, it's worth X number of points. We could pick up a crackhead, right? We're in Springfield. I think it'd just be a real team builder. You know, this is complete BS. Mark is always gonna set himself up to win the competition. He's gonna give me like 50 bucks, say, go, hey, go buy a car, and that includes your gas money, to get to Florence and back, or some crazy made up crap like that. It doesn't matter, we don't have time for it, because like, end of the day, it's gonna be Mark comes out victorious. I'm gonna choose not to engage, and let's just get this car back on track. We got team B2C, Bear to Cerveza, Skinny T. No, you're not. What Got a 2003 Range Rover, 1800 bucks, cash money. It's a good, oh, cash, yeah, all yeah. right. Hi there, I'm Kevin Mansky. I'm the other half of Beers Two Cervezas, and we're into it, like I said, about 1800, yeah. Contraband? No, it's a cigar. You'll never get out of Lane County. <laughs> we will make our stops someplace where we don't want to go, but the points will be too hard to resist. You get a tattoo along the way, you get points. No kidding. Right, yeah. <laughs> what you if you pick up a wedding. serial killer? Yeah. <laughs> That's got to be worth 10 points. I, we, we'll consider it. Okay, yeah. all right, done. This will not be as much fun for us as it will be for Mark. Hey, I'm Brian Long. We got a Range Rover 2005. We paid $2,000 for it. No, you didn't. And we're all in at 27, 22, 71. My name's Chris Starling. Chris Sterling? Yes, sir. Smile. Hollywood right there. <laughs> What's your name? Morning, Kevin Nix. Oh, shake and bake. I yeah, shake and bake, shake, shake and, and bake. Nice hair. Is that Thank your you. real hair? Yeah, I've been growing out for months. Uh, Shallon Bivens. Brandon Nickerson. Right. Team Shake and Bake. We got 1969 Buick Electra. Purchase price, 2200 Was there I'm, two grand in the glove box there when might you bought have been. it? Yeah, we got, uh, what, what should I do with my hands? Uh, you know, we're going through Reno and Vegas, so it's here, Springfield, Oregon, to Reno, to Vegas, to San Felipe, Mexico. So crashing a wedding is points. Oh, that's great. And yeah. we, there's some good opportunities there, Reno and Vegas. Oh, lots of good stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> What's your name? Ryan Nickerson. Jackson Oates. 1988 Chrysler LeBaron. Paid oh, 1900 yeah. 1900 bucks. Yep. That's the only car that's going to make it. <laughs> 
Head. Tyler Head. Hey, any relation to Johnny Head? Uh, negative. Richard Head, yes. Oh, no, that's my dad. Yeah, no, it's my dad, really. I'm Kevin Cohen. We got a 2006 Lincoln Stretch Limo. Regardless of what the ghouls think, we're going to do this. This is a fun thing. Everything I've had in the past that I thought was fun turned out to be fun even if they didn't want to. So we're going to do it, all right? I'm going to set up a route. I'm going to figure out all the checkpoints, all the extra points that they're going to get at these different checkpoints. We're going to meet somewhere in Florence or up the coast a little bit further, and I think it'll be a fantastic time. If you watch these guys, they went on a 3,000-mile journey. They had the time of their life. This would be just a smaller version of that, you know? For how much? 2,700 bucks. No. Yes. We're going to get on the road. We're headed home. Where's home? For me, Baja. Yeah, Los Burritos. Yeah, really. Los Burritos, I think you made Los that Burrito. up. <laughs> so will you guys go down I-5 and then over the Siskiyous and over into Susanville? No, we're actually going to go over to the pass today. Okay. 50 on 58 Got near it. Klamath Falls. That's how I just yeah. came back from Vegas the exact okay. same way. Who's going to win this thing? You know, I, I'm actually, right now, point leaders, because there's also points on how early you purchased your car, okay. and then, of course, how much money's already spent. I would say I'm probably leading. No, I'm definitely I'm leading. Felicia with the Flames, she's going to win. I don't know. I think Barry's going to do good. So you guys are going inside right now. What are you going to do? You head out on the road? Yeah, and then they're going to we're going to unveil this scorecard. It's a seven-page scorecard. Gotcha. So the drivers, the participants need to kind of familiarize themselves with how to earn points, and then we're off. We're I Reno today. It's going to be a blast. Right. I wish everybody yeah. the best of yeah. luck. Thank you, Mark. Good luck. Appreciate yes. you being yep. here. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. to putting headliners and vinyl tops on. It depends a lot on the temperature and the humidity at the time that you're spraying glue on the vinyl tops. If you put them down too soon, the glue still wants to continue to gas off and it won't dry correctly. And the hotter it is, the faster the glue dries, the cooler and the more humid it is, the slower the glue dries. So you gotta kind of work with your atmosphere. Once I get the top positioned correctly in the car and I know it's in center, I spray the vinyl top and the roof of the car. I glue the the roof and the vinyl top. So after I get the top glued down to the car and make sure that the seams are straight, and then it's cutting and snipping and trimming and making sure that everything's accurate. On April 11th, 2017, Graveyard Cars unveiled its first ever convertible Hemi Roadrunner. Option from the factory with an automatic transmission. This rare bird is one of only six produced by Plymouth that year. And when you consider it featured power steering, power windows, and left the factory wearing the ultra rare and highly desirable Q5 Seafoam Turquoise Paint, it is most certainly the only one in the world like it. Our little Roadrunner needed only minor metal replacement before moving on to the mudroom and paint shop. Graveyard Cars number one painter, Will Scott, laid out a mirror finish PPG base coat clear coat and polished it to perfection. Moving forward, the team began assembling this chaparral cock in record time. Installation of the drivetrain went smoothly. When it comes to the installation of a 426 Hemi in anything, the problem always is size, size, size. You're trying to stick this great, big, huge elephant engine in a regular size normal car. With as many hands as we have on deck, we shouldn't have any troubles. What you want to do is get the engine installed without beating the hell out of everything around it. Keep coming. Breathing. Okay, that looks really good there. Except for one small oversight on Mark's part. Hey, what the f are you laughing at, Nancy? You want to come <laughs> leg squat it? A little b I can probably oh, Back down, you think? You want some I'm, a, I'm not in my strength zone. This is my strength. Now I'm. I'm, I'm... Yeah, well, don't hold on to the cross member or the sway bar. It's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You're a dumb son of a. <laughs> I didn't let him go for a while. You could have. Oh, f you chrome oh, dome. Great. You can come back a little more. Room temperature IQ? You're in no position to laugh at me. Room temperature? There's well, my yeah. buddy, Mark. <laughs> son of a.
Exterior trim check, interior trim check, final QC check, and this bird was ready to fly. Will's busy. I wouldn't trust So I can help you out, and I could take it on a test drive if you would like. What are you talking about? What do you think? RM27J9G. One of one 1969 that Hemi Roadrunner convertibles and sea foam turquoise with an automatic transmission, a half a million dollar car. You would like to take it out on its maiden voyage? I'm here to help you. The original plan was for Mark's daughter Alyssa to drive the car with her dad. Unclasp the convertible top and then drop it all the way down till it's seated and then we'll be ready to go. You're doing a good job. Doing a good job, I appreciate it. I'll be it. ready. She's trying to desperately to drive one of these cars. That's danger, that's conflict. That's, that's, that's a half a million dollar car, all right? I had a valuation done on her, all right? She's a 200 grand kid, all right? On the market, 200 grand. That, that's a half a million. What? But when she had an epic fail. Can her off, start her up. Cut. Use the firepower there. As I was saying, things are going awry at Graveyard Cars, right? There's a car she thinks is fuel injection. She can't start you set it. me up. Because she doesn't know you have to you hold the foot down. Up. Because it's probably partly, partly flooded from sitting around, right? Hold your foot down. What in the name of are you doing? And Mark had an epic reaction. Get out. No, tell, okay, tell me how it's to do it. It's a half a million dollar car. No, tell I can't tell you. Tell me how to do you. it. Not I'll one step at a time. How. All bets were off. And dear old dad had to take the wheel. Up. Are you kidding to me? To say it is is. It was only warmed up because I tried okay. to start it. it is. A hot summer day in a cool car. and customers waiting for their baby to return home. Woo. Look at that. Wow, that's beautiful, huh? Amazing, look at that. The color's amazing. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's just incredible. The color just lightens up tremendously and it looks, it just looks awesome. Hey, get out of the car, my turn. This is what makes this Graveyard Cars classic milestone. One for the record book. Plymouth only built 3,197 Barracudas with a slant six engine and an automatic transmission. The engine produced 145 horsepower, it got 18 miles to the gallon, and it ran an impressive quarter mile at 18.5 seconds. This little jewel is B5 Blue Fire Metallic, and it also happens to be the subject of this week's autopsy report. So remember, when we look at a fender tag, we read it left to right, bottom to top. Looking at this fender tag, it looks like this is gonna be the shortest autopsy report I've ever done. There's only three lines? All right, starting on that left bottom corner, D31904 torque flight, BH23. This is the first four digits of the vehicle identification number. It also means that this is a two-door hard top. The H means that this is a Barracuda and not a Cuda. C0E. C stands for 225 cubic inch engine. Zero is the model year, which is 1970. And E is the assembly plant that it was built. In this case, it's Los Angeles. 106598. That is the unique serial number for this car. Moving on up to the next line, EB5. That is the exterior color of the car. And that is blue fire metallic. H4B5 means it had bench seats with fold down armrests in blue. 000 represents the one piece interior trim panel. 924 is the scheduled production date for this car, which is September 24th, 1969. 122000 is the shipping order number for this car. You can also find that number on the broadcast sheet and in the window sticker. 
Moving up to the last row, we have EB5 again, and this time that's the roof color, but it still means blue fire metallic. J25, variable speed wipers, which I think for the record is the only option this car has. M21, drip rail moldings. R11, music master AM radio. V5X, protective body side moldings. In 1970 on a Barracuda, if you did get V5X, you would have also got a pinstripe around it. Obviously it's been removed on this car, but from the factory you would have got a pinstripe and the V5X protective body side moldings. So if you want to wrap it up now with, I think it's a real hard one coming up, END. <laughs> END, that's the end of this sales code and the end of this week's autopsy report. Stay tuned. With the Vanishing Point Challenger shifting gears between metal and paint, Will and his son Brody are stepping up to paint the rarely seen Alpine White. It's a weird color. This is only the second time we've done Alpine White. Will the paint shop's unique approach pay off when they decide to go beyond the original factory protocols? When these cars are apart, I'm able to get paint. Areas you really can't reach when the car is together, and factory didn't even do. Finally, will this build meet Mark's expectations as an homage to one of his favorite cars and one of his favorite films? I have watched and loved Vanishing Point since I was a kid because it's a great car chase movie. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. Josh has all the sheet metal hung on the Vanishing Point car. Looks amazing like always. Now it's time to start doing the jam work. You know, this is only the second time we've done Alpine White. It's a weird color because it's it's a very creamy color. But when the car's done and assembled, it's very rich, it's very deep looking, and it's actually a really nice white. You know, like we've been doing for years, when these cars are apart, I'm able to get paint inside the quarters, outer wheelhouses, underneath the Dutchman, areas you really can't reach when the car's together, and factory didn't even do. But here we're like, since the car's apart, Let's paint as, every square inch as much as we can so when the car is assembled and all welded together, we just have to do minor touch-ups. So once the painters were done painting the inner quarter panels and the inner structure, I was able to throw the quarter panels on and send it off to mud. I have watched and loved Vanishing Point since I was a kid because it's a great car chase movie. Like Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry. It's, it's just good stuff. You got your horror ones. I love Phantasm, Christine. It's all good stuff. The car, underrated movie in my opinion. But it's so fun for me to be able to watch this car, a, a car that I kind of grew up loving, come into life now. I'm surprised we haven't done one earlier. In the same token, I'm really proud when you look at the work that was done on this car so far in the metal shop, the lines from the quarters to the doors to the fenders, I know that everything is as good or better than the factory did, period. And we know that because we do it by hand with care, it's better because that is what we do. That is why we are graveyard cars. And when you look at that car and you know it's right and you see it at a show, you'll say, wow, that's gotta be graveyard cars. <laughs>